This podcast is brought to you by LMU Munich. Thank you. Uh, I'm very happy to be here and thanks very much for the invitation. So I will use these lectures to uh, tell you a bit about uh, all my thoughts on black holes over the years and what I think the resolution is for all the puzzles. So this is how I plan to plan my lectures. In this first talk, I'll just give you some very elementary background on what the puzzle is. I understand that the students here might be from a varied set of backgrounds, and you won't actually need to know anything very detailed uh, mathematically about black holes or string theory to understand what's going on. We'll just talk in terms of pictures for most of the time, because the problem and also solution we have are really just physical issues. So as long as we understand the physics, we are good. So please do stop me and ask questions all along the way, because we just want to understand the guts of the puzzle, and that's really all that matters. OK, so in the first talk, I'll try to give you a first pass on the puzzle, and then I'll give you a rigorous form of the puzzle, which is the small correction theorem that Kiryak was also mentioned uh, during his talk. Uh, in the next lecture, I'll try to tell you what the solution of the puzzle should be, at least for string theory. And uh, to do that, I'll first introduce to you all the results on black holes in string theory, which were developed over the years, in particular, the, we'll come across the entropy formula of Strominger, Waffa, and so on. But if you don't know any string theory, that's fine. Again, this is just pictures, and you can just understand how black holes are made in string theory. And then with that, I'll tell you how uh, we should actually solve the puzzle in string theory, which is something I call the fuzzball paradigm. In the third lecture, we'll come and do an assortment of uh, things. One of them is to understand how the semi-classical approximation at the horizon can break down, because the horizon looks like a big classical object and look like no quantum gravity could ever help you there. And that, in some sense, was why the puzzle was so strong. And we want to see how that actually broke down uh, with what we had with fuzz fuzzballs. I'll try to give you a picture of how I think gravitational collapse should proceed uh, in view of what we have with fuzzball, the fuzzball proposal. If I have time, I'll talk about firewalls and tell you where there was a hole in the firewall argument. Uh, and in the end, I'm, if I have time left, I'll talk about cosmology and the Big Bang, which are the kind of things I'm thinking about these days, because the Big Bang singularity is also a place where lots of particles come together, very much like a black hole where lots of particles come together. So if you understand the black hole's resolution of the black hole puzzle, she also maybe tell us something about how the Big Bang should behave. OK, so let's get started with some extremely basic things. And as I said, they are very basic. You all know gravity is an attractive force. And so what is the consequence of that? So if you take a big mass here, capital M, and you take a test mass here, little m, and you keep them apart at some distance r, then the attractive nature of this force is built into the formula for the potential energy. And just the Newtonian formula is here. But there is a minus sign here. And the minus sign is what tells you this is an attractive force. And as we will see, the entire puzzle and everything we learn from it, which should completely change our picture of how quantum gravity works, is all because of this minus sign. So let's see how that happens. So that if you just look at this mass by itself, then uh, as Einstein told us, there is some intrinsic energy in that, E equals mc square. So it is some uh, positive value which you can <laughs> associate to that mass. But now if I keep it near this other mass, big M, then I also have the potential energy. And since we're just doing approximate things, let's just write down what the total energy of this mass should be called. This is the intrinsic part. And normally, we just add uh, all energies. So at least as a first approximation, let's write down mc squared minus this. And that's the total energy of this guy when it is kept near this object. You can already see there is something funny about this uh, expression. Because as you make r smaller and smaller, at some point, this whole thing becomes 0. And if you make r even smaller, then this total energy becomes negative. So here's my picture. This is the critical radius which we just got out of this formula. If I place something inside there, then the net energy of this, its own intrinsic energy mc squared, minus the gravitational PE, the net energy is negative. And you can begin to see how funny that is. Because if I just took this mass by itself, it had some energy, maybe capital mc squared. And then I add something. I put an extra particle in of mass little m, and my total energy has gone down. Normally, if you add something, total energy goes up. But here I added something, and total energy goes down. So why will that give us a problem? Because you can keep doing this. You can keep putting more and more particles here, and the total mass will keep going down. So you can make the mass go down to 0. 
or maybe the whole thing may stop at something like the Planck mass, so you'll get something of Planck mass. As now you have a low mass object, or maybe a massless object, which has a huge amount of internal structure. And again, if you just want to see how you got this into this problem, it's because you start with some big mass and you also add the other masses, but because gravitational PE is negative, I know all that can be canceled, and then uh, you have an energy which is close to zero. And now the problem is you can make an infinite number of these guys, because of course you can start with the initial mass of this red dot to be as big as you want, and then you can dial it down to zero by adding all these guys in, so there's no limit to how many such guys you can make, and so you make, can make an infinite number of these guys, and that already looks like a problem. Because there are infinitely many massless guys, or low mass guys, where are they? Uh, if you do a collision and you make make some kind of a loop process in quantum field theory. If there are lots of massless particles in your theory or low mass particles, they will all contribute to the loop and your loop will diverge. So this can't be right. We haven't seen these guys. Something is funny and something as simple as this actually is the entire guts of the information paradox. In some sense, you already have the problem here. Of course, so far we have been cheating because we've talked about gravity, the Newtonian gravity, and we use special relativity, but of course we need to put relativity and gravity together, the real theory should be general relativity, so let's go back and see how this thing should be done a little more properly. So of course the lesson of general relativity is that gravity is all encoded in the curvature of space-time, so this slide is just an introductory one. Uh, in flat space-time you have these light cones, so time you should think as up, and this is space, so light cones all just point up in, the, in flat space-time and particle trajectories should move inside the light cones, so they can be here or here, but they can't go like this. And if you have some heavy mass sitting somewhere that curves your space-time, say this is the sun and this is the earth, well now the light cones also tilt a bit and the space-time curves and now the path of this sort of goes like this, this is time, so it's actually going in a circle around that and that's how you get the orbits of the earth around the sun. Okay, of course you know all this, I just drew it as a cartoon for the next slide, because we just want to see what the black hole looks like. So if you have some star out here, and far away the light cones of course are going to point up as normal, because far away it is all flat space time, but as the star goes on shrinking, when you come here you can see that uh, it's more difficult to go out, you can still go out, but it's easier to sort of fall in, that's the attractive force of the star if you like, and at some critical radius, so you should think of this as r theta, as theta phi, and this is the radial direction r, and time is going up in this picture, at some critical point the light cone has tilted so much, that even if you're trying to go outwards at the speed of light, you just stay at the same radius, you just can't get out. So that's the uh, old boundary we had, that circle I was drawing, and inside this boundary in fact, the energy of particles can be negative. So it's all the same story, it just looks uh, now it's done more, more properly, and the point at which the star has made this kind of horizon here, uh, its density is still very low. We'll just see that on the next slide. So it's very hard to stop all this from happening, and of course as the star collapses further, it actually now can't stop itself from collapsing, because here now all the light cones point only inwards, so it has to keep going in, it has no choice, and so it ends up in a singularity. You are forced to a singularity, nothing can stop this collapse as long as you move inside the light cone, and so this region gets cleaned out and it becomes a vacuum. So in the end, you'll just end up with a central mass at r equal to zero. Everything else will have to get cleaned out just by the structures of the light cones, and uh, that's your black hole. So the important thing was that at this place where uh, the thing goes inside the horizon, after the, as we saw, you can't stop the collapse, the density is still very low. And so that's a very fundamental fact, even though I'm sure you all know that. Let's just check that calculation. Why is it so hard to stop black hole formation? So the radius we saw of this thing, it was gm by c square in our Newtonian calculation. Doing this whole thing properly with general relativity doesn't change the answer much. You only get a factor of two. Okay, so basically you can just put the mc squared equal to gm over r. Uh, the, that's still almost the answer. You only get an extra factor of two from general relativity. So then if you put in the mass as four pi by three, just the Newtonian approximation, and then you put this mass in here, then you just write it out, and you find the density at the point where the guy is going into its horizon, uh, these are all just constants, but goes like one by r squared. So if you're making a very big black hole, then the density at the point where it's trying to go into its horizon is still very low. So at this point, the density is very low. So let's just emphasize that point. You can choose any density you like. Suppose you want to put one dust grain weighing one gram in every cubic meter, and the next cubic meter, one more gram. Now that's a really low density, and you might think at those densities, no new physics can happen no string theory, nothing, you think you know what's going on. And then if you have enough of this, make a big enough ball, you are inside the horizon radius, and then the collapse cannot be stopped because of the light goes point in. So just causality 
and a density arbitrarily low where you think you know, know the physics and you are in the problem of the black hole. So again, we are, the reason we're emphasizing these very simple things is that when we really get into our puzzle and get stuck, we struggle to get out of the problem by every possible way and we want to know is it easy to maybe not make a black hole or is it easy to, easy to do something else and that's why we just want to pick up all the basics and see this is all really built into the way we think about physics. Okay, so now as we said, repeating the whole thing with generally it doesn't change much. The radius just becomes 2 gm by c squared instead of gm by c squared. And if you go in here, you have a place where you can have that negative energy. So all through this talk, I've actually put down some of these questions in red. And what these stand for is the fact that there are many, many solutions which people will propose for the black hole puzzles. Okay? And whenever somebody proposes a solution to you, uh, if you want to understand exactly what he's saying or which approach he's taking to try to solve the problem, there are certain basic questions you can ask. Okay? And so those questions are really the creature wants to understand what is the resolution that's being proposed. And so this is the first question that you should ask. In your model, is there any region where the energy of a test mass would be net negative? Like, do you have a horizon? Second question is, if he says, no, I don't have a region like that, then how do you stop the horizon from forming? Because you saw that was also very hard to stop because the density was very low. So either you change physics of that low density collapse or you have this kind of a region and now you can actually put things with net negative energy. If someone doesn't have either of those in his model, uh, you have to ask him what are you doing. Okay, so now let's go back and see what Hawking told us in this story. And so again, back to the same picture. And now let's ask, how do you actually put the particle in there? Are you going to like take your hand and like go and put, put somebody in there? Nobody goes and puts a particle by hand inside a black hole. And what Hawking told us is that quantum mechanics will automatically place the particles in there for us. So we can't really avoid this problem. So how will quantum mechanics do that? We know that in quantum mechanics, uh, the vacuum always has fluctuation, just called vacuum fluctuation. So even if this room was otherwise empty, uh, you can have a spontaneous creation of an electron-positron pair. That's this creation from the vacuum. If this is time going up from the vacuum, electron-positron can ju just pop out. And after some time, they pop back into the vacuum. So it's just fluctuations. Particles come in and out. And these are things you can observe. With things like the lamp shift, you can actually observe vacuum fluctuations in uh, quantum mechanics, so in quantum field theory. So this is not something that is not known to us. But how long do those fluctuations last? If the energy of this particle, first particle pair was some amount delta E, which you have borrowed from the vacuum, well, how do you get that energy? Well, it's just a fluctuation, so it can't last, last too long. It lasts for a time such that delta E, delta T is less than or order H bar. So that tells you the scale at which you can borrow an energy E. You can borrow it for this much time, and uh, that's okay. That's exactly what vacuum fluctuations are. So these don't actually normally do much. They're going on all around you in this room. But if you do the same fluctuation near the horizon of a black hole, now something is interesting. Because the particle inside we saw can have net negative energy. Again, because the minus sign in the gravitational potential. And the particle outside has a net positive energy. And so you can arrange it so the total energy is actually zero. As the total energy is zero, then in fact delta t uh, doesn't have to be any finite number. You don't have to actually recombine. You can keep that uh, going on forever. And this is actually an on-shell state. And these particles can just stay. And this will now automatically come inside, and this guy is outside, so this guy can leave. And if this guy leaves, that's the process of Hawking radiation. So the outer particle drifts out to infinity like Hawking radiation, and this particle is inside because net energy was negative, the total mass of this, and therefore the critical radius, which was 2 gm by c squared. You can see I brought a little smaller over here. But then the process repeats again, another guy goes out, and, then, and, and so on. And in the end, so this keeps going down, and the radiation keeps collecting here. So energy is conserved in the process. Whatever energy you lose here is picked up here, and the black hole keeps evaporating. And so this is Hawking evaporation. So now there are two possibilities. If the black hole is going on evaporating, the simplest thing would be the black hole completely disappears and it just left in the vacuum, and you have all this radiation. That's what happens when you burn a piece of paper. You end up with a lot of radiation, and there's no paper left, uh, left there at all. Or because you're having a lot of structure in here, once the size radius of this gets down to Planck length, this argument we had that you know you have space there, you can get fluctuations, you can make a pair, the energy is negative, all that was based on having enough space to be able to talk in terms of normal quantum field theory. But if things are getting so cramped that you're down to Planck lengths, you might say, I don't actually know what is happening. And so the uh, further evaporation of the black hole may then stop, and then it will be left the Planck sized, something is called a remnant. But actually, either of these two possibilities are going to give us some troubles. But already we have two more questions to add to our list, which you should ask somebody if you propose a, a solution to the puzzle for you. If you have a horizon, 
can you stop or alter the process of Hawking evaporation? So we saw it's such a natural process, you're just doing pair creation, which you know already happens, and if there's negative energy here, positive energy here, you have on-shell states, you can just, the wave function flow into something which has the same energy, and you know, wherever a wave function can go, it normally does go, so you can't stop the particle production, and if you can't stop it, then the black hole will keep evaporating. If somebody says, I can stop or alter that process, you have to ask him, how? And then if the evaporation is not stopped or altered, then again, as we said, there are two possibilities. In your problem, does the black hole evaporate away completely? In your solution, if somebody gives you a solution, or are you left with a remnant? So again, these are the ways to uh, filter down any possible solution to the puzzle and uh, see where the, puzzle, the solution is heading. OK, so now let's see what's the problem with the evaporation. So far, it just looks like an interesting process, but not really a problem. So the problem actually comes here, and that really has to do with entanglement. So we said we could maybe put an electron inside here and a positron inside here when you do pair production. But of course, you could do it the other way around. You could have the positron here and the electron here. And really, what you get with a vacuum fluctuation is a superposition of the two. And this is what is called an entangled state. So entangled state just means that this particle doesn't have a state by itself. It is an electron if the other guy is a positron. It's a positron if the other guy is an electron. So overall, the whole thing has a well-defined state. It is this plus this. But individually, if I look at this itself, I can't really give it a state. Well, so vacuum fluctuations typically produce entangled pairs, and so that's exactly what's going to happen here as well. And so the state of the radiation particle is entangled with the state of whatever is left behind. This guy went back into the remnant, and so this state will be entangled with this state. So the entanglement actually comes from many places. You might say, look, why don't I just look at a radiation of particles which have no charge? Like electrons and positrons, I took that so they look nicely entangled. But what if I just take photons or something, or something which has absolutely no, uh, uh, no charge or anything like that? So as we said, it can come from, the entanglement can come from charge being positive or negative. So that's the one we're already talking about. But if you just took a photon, then the photon going out might be spin up, and the inside would be spin down, or down and up. And that's because when you produce a pair from the vacuum, the vacuum had no particular quantum number of itself. So you normally produce things whose total spin is zero. But then one guy would be up, the other would be down, one would be down, then the other would be up. So you would can produce entanglement by spin. And then you could say, well, let me take particles which have neither charge nor spin. Can I then get rid of this entanglement? No, the most basic entanglement actually comes from a third source. And that is the fact that in quantum field theory, this region is just a region of space with some Fourier modes in it. And if you excite that Fourier mode, you get a particle. You put two levels of excitation, you get two particles. That's how we describe particles in, uh, in, particle, in particle physics. So in fact, when you do this process, when you really do it with quantum field theory properly, in this particular Fourier mode, it's possible that there are no particles. We call it zero inside and zero outside, zero, zero. Or there might be one particle here, one particle here. We can call it one and one. Or there might be two particles this mode and two particles in that mode. You can call it two and two, and so on. Okay, so it doesn't matter how many terms there are, what these numbers there are. Typically, all you need to know is that the state is going to be entangled. But it's entangled just on the basis of occupation number, because the creation is just probabilistic. So you might create nothing. You get 0 and 0. Or you might create a pair. You get 1 and 1. You can also create two pairs and three pairs and so on. So if the occupation itself it doesn't even require spin or charge, then it itself generates entanglement. And so, so you, you, you know, typically, the inside and the outside particle will always be entangled. And for later reference, let's just note an entangled state is just something. If you have two systems, one described by state psi i of system A, one other system described by state psi i of system B, then if you have something times something by itself, that would be a non-entangled state. But if you're summing over many things, psi 1 times chi 1 plus psi 2 times chi 2 plus psi 3 times chi 3, well, then the state is entangled. So if there's more than one ci, which is non-zero, you get an entangled state. And so typical radiation is always going to give you entangled states. And as the radiation proceeds, the amount of entanglement actually becomes very large. If you uh, emit about n particles, then there are, uh, if we just take the simple model, let's do the electron and positron because they're all the same now as uh, conceptually. Let's call the electron with a 0 and a positron with a 1. So uh, there are 2 to the n possible arrangements of what came out. If this was an electron, this had to be a positron. If all the electrons came out, then all the positrons are in here. If some other sequence of electrons and positrons came out, its mirror sequence will be here, and so on. You can see that 2 to the n possibilities. And so the state is this times this plus this times this plus this times this. And so in fact, you have a huge amount of entanglement. So roughly speaking, if you are entangled state 1 times state 1 prime plus state 2 times state 2 prime, if there are n such terms, then the entanglement will be log n. So if there are two such terms, we call it log 2. If there are three such terms, it will be log 3. OK, so as we are going on evaporating a big black hole, uh, there are going to be, uh, there's going to be a large amount of entanglement between the two. But as we said, there are two possibilities for the uh, evaporation. So let's see what happens with both of them. 
So the first is that the evaporation proceeds completely and there's nothing left here. So that was what Hawking actually wrote in his 1974 paper, the black hole is evaporating towards uh, all, uh, down to zero mass. As you go down towards zero mass, actually evaporation speeds up. So you might as well say it just goes off. Okay, so if it goes off, then you just have a vacuum here and you just have this radiation here. But now the problem is this stuff out here can't be assigned any state at all. And why is that? If you have two different particles and they are entangled, if this is spin up, this is spin down, this is down, and this is up, as long as they are both in the universe somewhere, you can take them as far as you want, the whole system together still makes perfect sense. But if one of them actually disappears from the universe, if what was inside the black hole just disappears, if that's all gone, then this, this particle itself doesn't have any state. Because if it, it was up, if the other guy was down, it was down if the other guy was up, but the other guy doesn't exist, you actually don't know what state this has. So if you actually don't have any state at all, then you have a problem because uh, in quantum theory, everything should have a state. And this is a violation of quantum mechanics. This is what made Hawking, made Hawking very excited in 1975. And he said the formation evaporation of black holes violates quantum theory. Let's understand it in a little more detail because sometimes people find this a bit confusing. So let's just take two particles. As I said, you can take spin up, down, minus down, up. So made it a singlet. This is how you make spin zero out of two spins. Okay? So here is this particle, let's call this the particle which is inside the hole, this is outside. And suppose this one, which I drew in the red dotted circle, suppose that one disappears from the universe. At first people are tempted to say, okay, the other particle, doesn't it have now the state down minus up? It, you could say it has that state, right? But that's not quite right. If it had the state, this would be spin along the y direction. You know that it's up and down in the spin in the z and minus z directions. So up minus down is actually spin in the y direction. Okay. But here's the problem. If you, you could take the same state as here, and you could choose a slightly different basis. So you take this basis to have an e to the i theta, and for this particle, a to the e to the minus i theta, this is actually the same state as this. And now if this particle disappears, the state you're left with for this particle, it now looks like this. And you see there's an extra phase here. So you don't actually know whether you should write it this way or write it this way. And this is not the same state as this. If you choose theta equal to pi, for example, you get up plus down, and that is a spin pointing in the x direction. So uh, you, this particle, if, if you have two entangled particles, one of them disappears, the other one doesn't really have a state. The only thing left is the fact that 50% of the probability was up and 50% was down, and that is true both for spin up, spin y, and spin x, or anything in the xy plane. Uh, but you, you miss the phase, and that's what is the, so the information left is that of a density matrix, which only has probabilities, but you miss all the phases, and that's why the remaining spin actually does not have a state. So this was the problem that Hawking ran into. And so with this, you can actually see the information paradox as Hawking found back in 1975. You start with some star, which has some state, however complicated. Some state psi initial. It goes and makes uh, some psi i. It makes a black hole. Then entangled pairs are produced. You can just model them with two things. Just call them maybe a 0, 0, and 1, 1. It doesn't matter how you model the entanglement. Just write it as an entangled state. And then in the end, if this guy goes away, then these guys don't have any quantum state. And that contradicts quantum theory, because in quantum theory, if the initial thing had a state, and there's some Hamiltonian, we don't know what it is for quantum gravity, but if there was one, there would be a state in the end, psi f, and if we are not getting that, you can't have quantum mechanics. So in the, end, in the beginning, actually, Hawking found this very exciting, that good, black holes don't have quantum mechanics. You actually can describe things not by wave functions, but only by density matrices, which have probabilities, and somehow black holes eat information and all that was around and they have entropy. So with all that, it, it looked nice to somehow have the idea that perhaps they do swallow up the phase and you lose that and quantum mechanics really changes. But nobody else was very enthusiastic about that because people love quantum mechanics and it works very well in the lab and everywhere else. So just because Hawking has something to say about a black hole, people are not very willing to give up on quantum mechanics. So what's the other possibility? So we can assume that when the evaporation is going on, when this whole thing gets down to the size of maybe Planck length, then the evaporation stops by some quantum gravity process. Okay. But now the problem is that this guy will have to have at least two to the n internal states, because this had all the partner states in here. And so all the states had to fit in this small volume. And so now you have to ask, in, if you had to make a model in a reasonable field theory, uh, you need an unbounded number of states here, because you could start the mass black hole arbitrarily big and come down to Planck size. So there'll be more and more of these. Can you hold an unbounded number of states, all within a Planck volume, and all with energy limited by Planck mass? Normally, if I give you arbitrary large mass, you can hold an arbitrary large number of states. Or if I limit your mass and I give you an arbitrary large volume, you can hold an arbitrary number of states. Because the volume of phase space in units of h bar cube is the number of states you can fit in a quantum system. 
But here we have limited both the volume and the energy. And then normally you'll have a finite volume of phase space. So how do you fit an infinite number of states in there? And actually, this is not really a problem for gravity because this funny minus sign we started with. Once your energy is unbounded below, if you really had minus g m1 m2 over r, you can actually put two things very close together and liberate lots of kinetic energy and get lots of phase space. So it's not, even though for normal field theory you wouldn't be able to do that with gravity because that minus sign, in principle there is no problem. And because the people working in GR couldn't find any other way out of this uh, paradox, most of them actually settled on this solution. That remnants are okay, even though it looks funny to have so many states hiding in that tiny ball, let's just take it and go on. But actually it doesn't work for string theory people. And the reason is if you accept things like ADS CFT, then you cannot have remnants. The reason is rather simple. So here is our picture of ADS CFT. And again, if you don't know ADS CFT or you're not have a, have a string theory background, it doesn't matter. It won't affect the rest of what I'm going to talk about. So in ADS CFT, you have some space time. And again, think of time as being up. This has the radial direction and this has theta phi. So this space has a curvature making an antecedent of space time. And this boundary, which is a surface of a cylinder, that's where I have a field theory, a conformal field theory, CFT, which is dual to that. So it actually has all the information of that. Now let's see how the CFT dictionary works uh, to the for the purpose we need. The CFT is something like an SU and gauge theory. And N is a finite number, just an ordinary field theory. And it lives in a finite volume. This circle is a spatial volume. It has some, some volume. Okay. And so the CFT has finitely many states if you bound the energy. Now it's just a field theory. Okay. And it lives in a radius of this. This circle is RCFT. The ADS has a curvature scale, RADS. Now we can just get all the energies connected between the ADS and the CFT. If the curvature scale of this is R ADS, it's some big curvature scale, maybe a kilometer, then one over R ADS is the energy of one photon or one graviton with that wavelength. That's the basic unit of energy in ADS space. So one excitation of that much energy put in the center of ADS has an energy. On the boundary, you have a, a field theory living on a circle of radius R CFT or sphere of radius R CFT. So natural energy scale is one over R CFT. That's the lowest energy scale you can fit in that box. And so the, this a quantum of this energy in the bulk of ADS maps to a quantum this this energy in the boundary. Okay, don't actually need to know the numbers. It's just to tell you how the map works. But now if you have Planck mass object sitting here, you can see how many units of this minimum energy it is, and it will correspond to that many units of this energy in the boundary. OK, but that's just to tell you how the CFT map, map works. It's a finite number. And if it's a finite number with a finite energy in a finite gauge theory S U N, uh, there are only a finite number of states. So you can't have an unbounded number of states for the remnant. And so the remnant theory would not work once you have ADS CFT. OK, so again, let's pick up on our question, which we are going to list for somebody who's trying to give a resolution to this puzzle. Does the entanglement keep rising between this part, the outside and the inside? We just saw that's what happened in the evaporation process. It's so natural, people have checked it for years. And if not, why not? Somebody has to give you a reason. Okay. Does the hole completely evaporate away? In that case, he has this problem of uh, evaporation. And if there's only a remnant left, and this is what you have, then if, if you say, I'm going to go for remnants, then do you accept there's no analog of ADS CFT duality in your theory? And a GR person will be OK with that, because they don't like string theory particularly. And so if ADS CFT goes, it's no big loss to them. But uh, if you do want to keep things like ADS CFT, uh, you can see the remnants will not work for you. OK, so we are collecting some questions here. And given the number of troubles we are facing, let's go back and ask questions uh, one by one, which we had earlier discarded. We had said it's very easy to make a horizon, because things just fall in even at low density. You can make a black hole which is big enough. But can we prevent the formation of a horizon by some method? And we'll actually see it's not that easy to prevent the formation of a horizon. OK, so let's see. So as we are having trouble, let's see if we can prevent this whole thing from happening. So we, we've already seen the density at the point where the star has to go inside the horizon can be very low if you start with stars which have a very big radius. So, but can we quantify the fact that it's very difficult? Saying it's very difficult doesn't mean much. But uh, can we quantify that difficulty? And the reason it's difficult is that once something comes close enough to forming a black hole, we saw the light cones had tilted quite a lot. And so it's very difficult to prevent it from tilting all the way and just collapsing in. OK, but can we quantify that? So there's something called Bukta's theorem, which just a result in uh, classical general relativity. So suppose you take a perfect fluid and you make a ball of it, but bigger than the horizon radius. Horizon radius was 2m. Now I set g and c to 1. Okay? So the horizon radius was just 2m. And this is 2 and a quarter m. So if I take a radius which is 
let's say two and a quarter m, or just a little bit less than two and a quarter m, and I make a perfect uh, fluid sphere here, actually, you can't stop the collapse. At least the pressure will diverge somewhere inside. Let's see what this theorem said. So this is how the theorem is proved. You just take any spherical, uh, static spherically symmetric metric, and again, if you're not very familiar with GR, it doesn't matter. You just need the, the rough picture, and that's enough to go on. So you take the metric of a sphere, just this general answers for a spherically symmetric static metric, and this is the stress tells you write for a perfect fluid. It has pressure, it has density. Okay. And then how do you solve the ba pressure balance equation? What you have to solve is the gradient of the pressure has to balance the attractive force which comes from gravity. So if you're writing a Newtonian thing, the dp by dr would just come from rho because generally it would you also get a bit of p. But anyway, this is the equation of pressure balance. At the surface of the star, the pressure is zero because there everything ends. And then you use this equation to start integrating p inwards. So you'll see p rising because of this, because every piece of matter has to be supported by the pressure gradient behind it. And if you solve this equation, at some point before reaching the center, suppose you find that p at some point becomes infinity. Then what would you say? Well, you would say this is unphysical, and the star better collapse, because it can't, it can't be steady. And so if you, what, what the, if you argue from here, you find that if the radius of this outer the star is less than 2 and a quarter m, then the p reaches infinity before reaching the center. And so once you compress things to that amount, you actually can't stop it, whatever you do. The pressure will just make it go in. Okay, so I just put that in here. So if you have a, a star like that, it's just going to collapse after that. And so again, you can now ask the question, did my pointer just stop working? Can we check? Maybe I switched it off by mistake. I'm just wondering what I did. Okay, I put it off and on. Okay, thank you. Okay, so again, uh, in the list of questions we have, uh, if somebody has a theory for you, you can ask him. In your theory, if you make the star reach a size which is still bigger than the horizon, but you know, not a few planets outside the horizon, but you know, two and a quarter m, then can you stop the collapse in your theory? If so, how? Because even though you don't have to have a perfect fluid for a star, in general, these arguments of just pressure balance is very generic. So in fact, there have been many extensions of the book does theorem. People have relaxed a lot of conditions. And as long as there's some kind of pressure, which is there roughly in every theory, you really got to ask how you beat this problem. It looks like if you come close to collapse, it will collapse. If it collapses, you will get a clean horizon because light cones force everything to go. You have empty space, you will get pair creation. It's just a property of the vacuum. Then you have entanglement problems, and you're stuck. OK, if you can't prevent the horizon from forming, can you distort the horizon? So here we again have theorems. They are called the Noher theorems. And so people uh, try to argue if the horizon wasn't exactly the same nice round one that Hawking assumed from the Schwarzschild metric, then maybe his calculation would be altered. But in fact, there you have things. Uh, one of the classic Noher theorems is just the one by Bekenstein. And again, there have been many, many extensions of this. So suppose just take a scalar field phi, and you try to add it onto the black hole to deform the structure of the black hole. So what does that mean? You will take a scalar field, and you assume a time-independent answers for the metric. You see, even the spherical symmetry is not assumed. Just take a time-independent static metric as your assumption. Take a scalar field, which just has a free part and a potential, but the potential is assumed to be stable. So V double prime, it's convex downwards, just a stable potential for the scalar field. OK, and then in that case, if you try to see whether you, whether you can get any static solution with this phi is just supported there, the only solution is phi equal to constant, Phi equal to constant actually has no gradients. It doesn't produce any stress tensor. And if it doesn't have any stress tensor, it doesn't distort the background. So you only end up getting trivial solutions, and the geometry of the whole does not deform. So there are many theorems like this which tell you that you can't actually deform the shape of the horizon. You're going to be back into the one that Hawking was using. One very important uh, aspect of this, though, is many people think that the no-head theorems are classical. And if that was the case, there's a big hole in there in the argument. Because suppose you leave the classical vacuum to be all classical geometry to be just a Schwarzschild one, but suppose you could change the quantum state around the horizon. Then the Hawking argument could again break down because the pair production was some property of the quantum vacuum. It's a quantum process after all. So if I could change the quantum state around the horizon, uh, then the argument would be changed. But actually the Nohead theorem is much more powerful than just the classical versions that one might see elsewhere. There is a quantum no hair theorem, even quantum mechanically, at least perturbatively, you will not be able to add any hair to the black hole. And this part is even more important to understand than just the classical no hair theorem. So let's see how that works. 
So you just again it will take a free, free scalar field. Let's even take away the, away the potential. Let's take a massless scalar field, and the solution to this wave equation in flat space they just look like this. Right? So we have to pick up a little bit on how quantum field theory works. I'm sure all of you have had some kind of a course in quantum field theory, but I'll soon need to talk a little bit about quantum fields in curved space and. Uh, let's just build up our notation of quantum field theory so that we can also talk smoothly about quantum fields in curved space. I believe that uh, Lara's already covered a little bit of quantum fields in curved space for you uh, earlier in the week. But let's just recall the notation. So if you have a wave equation like this, its solutions look like plane waves and the frequency is equal to k mod. So how do you quantize this field? To quantize this field, you expand the field in all its with, as a, in terms of basis of all its solutions, but the coefficients of those basis functions, you make them into operators, and now the uh, function, this field phi, has become an operator valued field. And then these coefficient functions, you put computation relations between them, and they are the same computation relations as you have for a harmonic oscillator. So let's just recall the basic physics which goes into this whole quantum field theory. If you just have a quantum field, like a scalar field, or it could have been the electromagnetic field, uh, Classically, when the field is zero everywhere, there's no energy. In any given Fourier mode, if I increase the amplitude of the Fourier mode away from zero, it costs me energy. Okay, I can make the amplitude positive or negative. In both cases, the energy goes up. So every Fourier mode basically has the Lagrangian of a harmonic oscillator. And every time you, uh, uh, so that once you quantize that, you just have a quantum harmonic oscillator. And if you excite to the first level, you get one particle in that Fourier mode. You go to the next level, you have two particles in that Fourier mode. And if you have no excitations, you're in the vacuum state. That's all there is to quantum field theory. Okay? So let's just take that and see how we'll take it to curved space. So now each Fourier mode becomes a harmonic oscillator with frequency omega equals k mod. And the state is killed by all the a hats. Uh, that's the vacuum when there are no excitations. It still has the same fluctuation that you have for every harmonic oscillator. Those are the vacuum fluctuations we talked about before. but. Uh, Again, if you now want to create particles, you can just act with several A daggers with different Fourier modes, and now you get one particle of Fourier mode K1, one particle of Fourier mode K2 up to Kn, and that's how you make particles. And you can make coherent states by taking particular things like this, which is just some complicated combination of these guys, and with here mu k is just a complex number, there are some particular states in the same Fox space of, of things, and if you take a large value of mu k, then the expectation value of the operator phi hat, it actually satisfies the same wave equation we had before. And that's the, how we connect back to the classical field equation. So you do all this blah, blah, and then you take these coherent states, and you take mu large, and then the expression value of phi, well, that's your classical field. So you quantize everything, and you're back to classical mechanics. It's good to understand this, because when we actually start making a solution to the puzzle, we'll actually make the whole microstates of the black hole in the full string theory. Sometimes we'll just write the classical solutions as these coherent states which basically look like classical solutions like this, but you always got to understand they come from things like this, which really come from things like this, and if you actually want to make the whole quantum state, it really is made of exciting oscillators somewhere back there. Okay, so now the same formalism works in curved space-time. So in curved space-time, the equation box phi equal to zero, well now you take semicolons, the covariant derivatives, and you need to contract with not eta ab, but g ab, but anyway, the basic equation is the same. And again, you can look for solutions of this field equation. Now, I don't actually know what they are, so I'm not calling them e to the i kx minus omega t. I'm actually putting them as just some fi of, this is both space and time. So this is a complete set of functions, fi, and the complex conjugates are here. You can again expand phi in a complete basis of functions and their complex conjugates. You can again make the coefficients of them operators instead of just c number coefficients. And again, impose the same computation relations. The vacuum of this uh, thing, of the state, is again given by the state which is killed by all these A hats, and you can create particle excitations again by acting with these. So even if you have curved space, the formalism of quantum field theory doesn't change. All you need to do is to solve the same classical field equation in terms of modes. The modes won't look like e to the i k x minus omega t anymore, but whatever they are, the rest of the story is the same as before. So let's go back and see how you would actually use this for a simple case. So suppose I gave you a star. A star is just something sitting out there. It could just be the moon or any planet. Okay? And then I want you to add some hair to this. I want you to change the quantum state around the moon. How would you actually go around doing that? Okay? So again, you suppose you want to add hair of the uh, scalar field. So you have this wave equation. You have to solve the wave equation in that background. Because it's spherically symmetric, you might as well solve it using uh, ylm of theta phi times some function of r and then e to the minus i omega t. Okay, because time independent, I can factor this out. I can factor these ylm of theta phi out because spherical symmetry, and I get radial functions of r. And then you can expand your field operator phi hat as this function, its complex conjugate, 
and coefficient functions. And again, this commuter to this is equal to one, and the whole state is there as before. And the vacuum state is the one which is killed by all these a hats. Okay, so that's just the moon by itself. If I take this state of the quantum field phi around the moon, I have no excitations of the scalar field phi around the moon. I just have the moon. Okay, but if I want to actually excite this and add some quantum here to the moon, that's very simple. I just take some of these excitations and I act on this, and now I have some particles of this field phi which are hanging out around the moon. Okay, so that's how you change the quantum state around the moon. This adds hair to the star. You can take coherent states and you get classical deformation of the star. You can, of course, deform the moon, and that's all in here. The important thing is to understand that all this does not work once you have a horizon. Okay? If this did work when you had a horizon, there was actually no information puzzle in the first place because we could have done this. We could have changed the quantum state around the black hole. If the quantum state wasn't the vacuum, the pair production that Hawking computed would have some changes. It may or may not help you, but at least there would be changes, and then you have to go and ask if there's a paradox. So why doesn't this work if you had a horizon? And you go back and you try to solve the same wave equation with the same kind of answers because your spherical symmetry, blah, blah, everything is there. And this time you don't find good solutions for the radial wave function. So what happens to, the, to, the, to, the, to these wave functions? You try to solve it, just a differential equation. So you go on solving it. And as you come near the horizon, you find they oscillate more and more rapidly. And it goes like this. And the solution is completely singular. And so what do we mean by singular? If you compute, for example, the pressure, the stress tensor component RR at this place in a unit orthonormal frame, so it's like a physical quantity, it actually goes to infinity. Okay, so the back reaction, the stress tensor will completely kill your background. So in fact, there are no good solutions to this. And because you have no good solutions to this, you can't add you know, a, a dagger of these guys and actually change the state. So the quantum state around the horizon is also unique. And that's very important. There's no hair classically. That's what people in GR often talk about. But there's no hair quantum mechanically. We are forced to that same state as before. And if you just want to go back and see all these theorems, why are they all these theorems working? Why are we having so much trouble changing the state at the horizon? It's all back because of the picture we had. As you get close to the horizon, it's very hard to stay there. You keep getting sucked in. And you can see that if you just put a rocket near, near a black hole, you need to have a lot of emission from the rocket to keep the rocket stationary there. So uh, when you have motion this way and this way, relative boost is very large, that's like pressure. So just to hold something against the big gravity of the black hole, you need a lot of pressure. And that's exactly what you're seeing in these wave functions as they're oscillating more and more rapidly. So the physics is very basic, and it's the same thing which is showing up to the field equations. Yes, there was a question at the back. So just to understand, what mathematically are you showing unless you're saying that this is a solution which has a Which solutions are you looking at? OK, I'm looking at solutions of uh, the equation box phi equal to 0 with this answers for phi. YLM of theta phi, of course, is a known function. I'm trying to solve for this F L M N of R. And this F L M of N of R, that's the guy which behaves more and more rapidly as I come close to the horizon. In fact, any place where GTT is going to 0, that's going to happen. And what I try to measure to prove that they are singular is I try to measure from this phi, I compute the expected value of stress tensor component TRR, and that is diverging. Good, you can try any other answers if you like. If this is not a good answer, uh, let's see what would be. Because if I'm solving the equation uh, perfectly around the vacuum, actually this is a complete answer. Because if I have spherical symmetry, a complete basis of solution and time independence, which I have assumed, because time independence, I can always factor this out, and I can actually always get a complete basis of solutions. If I have spherical symmetry, I can always factor this out, and this will, solving this will give me a complete basis of solutions. True, but what I'm saying is if my background is time independent, actually I lose no generality by saying that I can actually take a time dependence of this kind and then superpose answers for different omega. That's just the Fourier theorem, right? If I did not have a background which is time independent, I could not do that and should not do that, right? Then I cannot take that out. But if the background is time independent, then e to the minus i omega t, factoring that out and then looking for whatever is left is actually a complete basis. So there is no assumption there. Good, yeah. She just keep stopping me with something not clear and just ask me. Don't let me just go on uh, if, if I've slurred over something in between. Okay, so let's see where we are. With all the discussion, the last few minutes, we've just argued that it's really difficult to get hair. So if I just crudely assume that, you know, Hawking was getting pair creation around the horizon, why don't I just corrupt the horizon in some way? And then, you know, then the whole thing could be altered and maybe it'll radiate like the surface of, of a piece of coal and this won't be entangled. I can't really do this because of all these no hair theorems. And so if you really come down to it, the whole information paradox is actually a combination of two different things. And one of them has to break. Otherwise, you can't get out of the information paradox. And the first one is 
the creation of the entangled pairs by the Hawking process. Okay, that's what creates the entanglement and the consequent problem. But the other half is the no hair arguments which suggest that the state of the horizon at the horizon cannot be changed. If you're forced to that horizon, in that horizon is a definite calculation. With that vacuum state, you get the pairs. That is a simple calculation was done by Hawking in 75, done so many times by so many other people. There seems to be no way to alter that part of the game. And so one of these two has to go, otherwise you seem to have a problem. Okay, so again, if somebody says, I have a solution to the puzzle, you've got to ask him which of these two uh, things you're going to change. And so again, in terms of questions, just ask the person, in your model, is there hair of any kind at the horizon? And if not, why not? How do you break the no hair theorem? Not just at the classical level, but at the quantum level. What about back reactions? So when you sum by going to the background is nothing, but what if you allow the background to be finite? You should you should take back reaction into account, but the way you can do it at this level is by just looking at the cubic and quartic interactions. Because suppose you say the metric will deform because of this back reaction. But I'm just looking for time-independent solution. When I'm adding here, I'm looking for something that stays there. Okay? So if I have phi, and it also creates a bit of h, the graviton field, h mu nu, then that includes the back reaction to that order. So if you have a Lagrangian which has d mu phi, d nu phi, h mu nu, which is the actual Lagrangian, I've coupled it to the metric, then once you take the three-point function into account, you will get the effect of the back reaction as a perpetual change to h mu nu. But now you need a solution for h mu nu and phi, which all stays exactly where it is. It shouldn't just fall into the black hole and disappear, because then you have not found any hair. Yes, you should uh, try to, if you want the back reaction, the next order, it's a, this is very, the back reaction will be very weak, of course, because when you just put one quantum, the energy of that is so low, there's almost no back reaction. But in principle, yes, you should take into account, but even with that, it's not easy to find hair. So if you just perturbatively try to add some h or something else, you will not find hair. You could ask what will happen non-perturbatively. And in fact, in the end, tomorrow when I come and tell you about fuzz balls, I'll tell you that even though people missed finding hair in all these things for all these years, non-perturbatively, when you have extra dimensions, you will find hair. In fact, you'll find a complete set of hair. So in fact, it is very correct to ask what will happen, but uh, it requires more than what's just here on the board. It's non-perturbative, and it needs the rest of the structure of string theory. OK, so now let's get slightly more technical. So let's go and look at the. Uh, structure of the black hole. So let's see what the black hole is and why we have this puzzle. So what exactly do we mean by saying we'll get a little more technical? So so far we've just been saying, you know, pairs are created, negative energy, positive energy, but now we want to see a little bit more of how the pairs are created. Because if you want to change any part of this game, you want to solve the puzzle, you've got a good physic you've got to get a good physical feeling of how these pairs are coming out, who can stop that? Okay. So the black hole will be described by the Schwarzschild metric. So there's the Schwarzschild metric, if you've seen this before. And the crucial point about this metric that you take from this is that this metric is only valid outside the horizon 2m. Because at r equals 2m, you can see everything is sort of going bad. But anyway, you can analytically continue this inside the horizon. So you can actually use the same metric inside, just that it's not smooth across. You'll have to use new variables r and t inside. But the crucial point about this is the following. For r bigger than 2m, uh, t is a time direction, because this is negative, And r is a space direction. And once you go to r less than 2m, this one has a positive sign, and this one has a negative sign. So r and t interchange roles. And so then t becomes a space direction, and r is like a time direction. Okay. So what's the uh, significance of that? For r outside the hole, r bigger than 2m, a slice like t equal to constant is space-like. That's the normal space-like slices we are used to, time equal to constant. But inside the black hole is turned around. For r less than 2m, r equal to constant is actually a space-like slice. So it's a very funny uh, thing, but this is a, the entire problem of the pair creation is actually due to this one fact. So let's just take a look at that. So again, this is a cartoon picture I've drawn. This let this be r equal to 0. Uh, here is the horizon r equal to m. This is the radial direction going to r equal to infinity. So then you can ask, what have I drawn here? I've actually drawn it in something called eddington Finkelstein coordinates. And if you don't know what they are, don't worry about it. It's just a schematic time going up, and the radius is going out. And all, what I said was, outside, the slices t equal to constant are space-like. But inside, r equal to constant are space-like. And so the funny thing you see right from this is that inside the black hole, it may look like it's only this big. And there's not that much space in there. And you might think that once you start creating particle pairs, the particle pairs inside, they may clog up the black hole. Maybe after some time, you can't produce any more pairs. But it's not like that. Actually, inside the black hole, there's an infinite amount of space available. And where is that space? 
Well, now this is a space-like slice at fixed r, and this just goes on and on. There's an infinite amount of space inside the black hole. And that's where we'll just see the negative energy particles actually collect on that slice. But the other important thing you see from this is that even though the Schwarzschild metric looks like it's time independent, it's not. It looks like time independent because the part we wrote only applied outside the black hole, or you can separately write it by continuing to the variables for r less than 2m, but it doesn't take you across 2m. And if you actually try to slice the entire geometry, including both outside and inside, the crucial point about the black hole is there's no way to slice this geometry such that every slice is like the preceding slice. So let me just repeat that because that's the crucial thing here. If you have Minkowski space or any static space, even if you have a star with a fixed, uh, which is fixed, not doing anything, you can make space-like slices. They'll come like this, maybe bend in the star and go out. But the slice in the next second will do exactly the same. And the slice an hour later will do exactly the same. So all the slices can be made. You can, of course, choose them to be different. But you can choose them to be all the same. And why is that so important? Because if the slices can be made all the same, then after a while, the vacuum on those slices, the quantum state on the slices, will settle down to some lowest energy state on those slices. And that's your vacuum. And then the guy just stays there. He's not doing anything. But if the slices are going to keep on bending and stretching, so you can see actually what's happening here is that later slices have to stretch. I can keep it equal to constant here. At a later time, I can also make the slice go anywhere. I can make it go closer to r equals 0, but I don't want to go there because that's where the singularity is. So I can asymptote them to some point in between, let's say r equals m. But then I have to just keep making them longer and longer here to join here. So later slices keep having more stretching here. And so you can never make slice the black hole geometry with slices where all the slices are the same as the preceding slices. And that is the reason why you keep getting particle creation in the black hole. If you have some slice and you try to put a vacuum on that, when the slice stretches and deforms, uh, it's no longer the vacuum. We'll come across that in a minute, uh, how that happens. And then particles keep on getting created. And because slices have to keep on stretching the moment you have a horizon, uh, you will always keep having particle production. And that's why a black hole keeps radiating while a star does not. The star radiates for its heat, and that's a different point. Yeah? Just a small correction. Actually, you can write down a family of slices that are all the same, but you need a non-zero uh, shift. Because if you have a shift. A shift. Yeah. Shift from one slice to the next one. Well, will they also go close to r equal to 0? Uh, you can make things that look just like your picture. Uh, sort of nice slices. You can also make slices that And will the shift also be the same from slice to slice? Uh, yes. OK. So, but that shift probably holds the same information of the stretching. Somehow it has to hold information yeah, yeah, that, the, the yeah. The shift is sort of encoding something that's similar to, or equivalent to the stretching. So OK. That's fine. So uh, I think the, what I would focus on is the fact that the intrinsic geometry of this slice and this slice, the geometry of the slice itself, actually can't be the same. So the stretching has to be there. It may be in the shift. But the, if I actually close this slice back here, if I take a black hole made by collapse, I don't think that the entire slice from beginning to end, its intrinsic geometry can be the same on different slices. If you're saying it still can be, then maybe I would like to talk to you about it. This one. The first one, yeah. And then just uh, translate that, given the killing symmetry, uh, you know, the, time, the time translation symmetry that we know we have in the problem, and it turns it into a slice that looks like the next one, and then the next one. So but that also moves it inwards here. Uh, actually, it doesn't. Oh, oh, you're saying just, OK, just take it up and up. You can do that, but then what about the lower end? Because as I was saying, I want to join it back to r equal to 0 before the black hole made was made. And this part, if it was infinite, it looks the same. But if you make it finite, this will actually become longer. Okay, so let's go and talk about later because I think the slice will still have to have a longer intrinsic length. Okay. So if you can't get a time independent slicing, what kind of trouble does that create for you? So if you've seen Penrose diagrams before, I don't actually plan to use them much because they actually create a distortion. But these are the same slices that you would draw like this. They cover the outside of the horizon and the inside. And you can see that the slices are actually uh, being stretched. But even but because the Penrose diagram squeezes things near the top, uh, the stretching is not so manifest. The advantage of the Penrose diagram is all the lines, the light cones are pointing in the normal way. And light cones go at 45 degrees. But anyway, if, I'm not going to use the Penrose diagram. But if you want to know what the slices look like on the Penrose diagram, well, these are the slices. OK, but now let's go back to how you create particles. 
So it's a change of the geometry that leads to particle creation. So first let's look at particle creation in a setting which doesn't involve the black hole. So you take a star, let's say of some radius, you know, 10 kilometers, and then it just collapses for some reason and maybe settles down to 5 kilometers. It's a solar mass star, so it's not down to 3 kilometers to actually make a black hole. Let's just change the metric from 10 kilometers to 5 kilometers. It again stabilizes. So in that process also, particles are created. The same kind of particle production of pairs will happen as would happen for a black hole. Why don't we then worry about it so much in this setting? Okay. So again, how would you solve the problem this time? Again, you would expand everything in functions of r, function of theta phi, coefficients, e to the minus i omega t. Well, this, this star is static and exactly where it is, you can expand the field like this. These functions e to the minus i omega t, we call them positive frequency solutions because in quantum mechanics, e to the minus i e t for positive e uh, is the way the wave function behaves. And then this other one which has e to the plus i omega t, we call them negative frequency solutions. And while the star is just static, as we said, you could always expand things this way. But after the star is stabilized to its new radius, we can again get an expansion of something like this, except there'll be some other frequencies, omega prime, uh, in the positive and negative frequency solutions. But the point is, while it's going from here to here in between, when you solve the whole wave equation in that in between time, everything is getting messed up. And so if you start with the solution to the positive frequency here, by the time you stabilize again to this, it will become a linear combination of this and this, both positive and negative frequency. Nothing very deep way of solving the wave equation, but if these two parts get mixed, then if I start with something which was the vacuum killed by all the A hats, after the evolution is over, then in fact I'm actually going to be killed by something which is a combination of A hat and A hat dagger, because the positive frequencies correspond to A daggers, and the negative frequencies correspond to, the positive frequencies correspond to A, the negative frequencies correspond to A dagger. So if I'm actually no, no longer going to be killed by the new A's, but I'll actually have some A's and A daggers in it, well now the vacuum state is not the vacuum, and now it has a state which actually has some A daggers in it, and it contains particles. So this is the entire story of particle creation. It's just that these functions, uh, exactly in line with the question which was asked before, uh, you can't actually have this ansatz if the space, if the metric is actually depending on time. And so whenever the metric is trying to change, the positive frequency don't stay positive frequency all time, but they can actually get mixed with the negative frequency solutions, and now something which was the vacuum is no longer the vacuum. This just looks like a lot of algebra, but the physics is very simple. If we just had this room, it always has some vacuum fluctuations. And now if I change the metric, suppose this is the new metric in this room, it will have its own vacuum fluctuation. It will have its own vacuum with some own vacuum fluctuations. But those vacuum fluctuations are a bit different because the metric is different. So when I change from here to here, I won't actually end up in that same identical state which would have been the new vacuum, I likely end up in some other state. So the, the extra vacuum fluctuations which are not in the new vacuum, they get released and those are the particle creations. So whenever we try to change from one uh, geometry to the next one, uh, the vacuum is different and the extra excitation just get released as particles and that's the particle production. So let's look at the scales of particle production, just understand the scales in this theory. Let's say all the length scale over which everything is changing, which was like five kilometers in the previous problem, let's just call that R. And the time scale, we'll also call it r. I said c to 1. So let everything happen on a scale r. And then it starts with some time-independent geometry, starts with some new time-independent geometry, but in between, everything was time-dependent. This is the space-time region of change. Time is this way, space is this way. Then how many particles do you create? Well, there are no dimensionless numbers in this problem. Okay, the number of particles just a pure number, and if everything is like length and time is just the same, the number of quanta you create is order 1. You create about one particle pair. What's the wavelength of the particles you'll create? There's only one length scale in the problem. You'll create a one or two particle pairs of wavelength r. Okay. And typically, they will be in an entangled state, so something like this. And in general, the energy of these quanta, of course, will be very low. Because if you have a radius of r, and r is 5 kilometers, that's a very low energy quanta. If you create only one of them, its energy is so low, it will hardly back it on the initial geometry. So in fact, there will be no significant deformation of the metric. And that's why we don't actually worry about this. Okay, so length scales are all clear. So now let's see how the black hole is different. The scales are actually not different, but the difference really comes from the following. In the black hole, as we said, the geometry cannot stabilize. So if we drew it in terms of those slices, the slices kept stretching and stretching and the geometry never stabilized. And uh, we can also look at this way, which is a little more physical for what we are doing. Again, I plot r in this direction radially, and this is my, let's say, Arrington Finkelstein direction. And recall this picture we had for the horizon, this is the horizon, so light cones far away are like this. As you get close, they are tilted a little bit inside, but from here you can still escape. 
So if you're very close to the horizon, you can still come out, 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 and leave. That's this line over here. If you're on the horizon, there's again a particle trying to go out. I've drawn only particles trying to head out, but this one never manages to make it out. It always stays on the line r equals 2m. And if you're actually inside r equals 2m, even though you're trying to head out, you actually get sucked more and more in, so you go here. So the entire property of a horizon is right here. What a horizon does is it separates trajectories. So things will start very close to each other. Eventually, they'll keep going like this together for a while, but eventually guys just outside will peel out and out and finally just leave. And the guys which are very close, just slightly inside, will go up and up for a while and then peel away and then just fall in. So in fact, you can see that some length over here will actually stretch and stretch and will just keep on stretching. And so as long as you have a horizon, you have this persistent stretching that's keeping on going on, and so your particle production will just keep happening. Okay? And so even though black hole produces particles of low energy uh, successfully one by one, uh, because the process doesn't stop, eventually the black hole is going to go all the way and disappear. So that's the actual reason for the, the effect of the horizon. If you didn't have a horizon, you'll just create one or two particle pairs and stop, uh, and so it's nothing, no, no big deal. But now you can see that they keep growing and growing. In fact, in this picture, you can also see how to compute the particle production. If you had a wave function like this, this for locally e to the ikx or something, this is just a piece of flat space here, so this is the e to the ikx. So this is the wave going up and down. Then you can do the icon approximation, where along a geodesic, you can just move the line of constant phase. So if this is a, a null geodesic, you can actually take uh, the, if the phase with a peak here, you can make it the peak here and the peak here. That gives you an evolution of the wave, which is essentially correct to leading order, and that's called the iconal approximation. So if you think of this as the wave, I've even actually shown you the whole evolution of the wave. And if you can see how the wave evolves, then we actually have our particle creation done. And so we can see the entire particle creation in this picture. Here's a small region of flat space, so let's take a Fourier mode that goes like this. And then each peak we follow by the iconal approximation, so it becomes a peak over here. And this peak, this is a, a dip, a trough here. It goes up and up, it becomes a trough here, and so on. So I just follow it up to a later slice, which is like this. And you can see that this function gets heavily distorted. And if a regular function is heavily distorted like this, then in general, a wave function which was e to the you know, i omega t on this, uh, it's actually a function wave going out, so it's e to the i k x minus omega t, it's a null wave, uh, it, it actually gets distorted like this, and then when you fully realize it now in terms of frequencies, it will have both positive and negative frequencies, you'll generally get particle production, and each particular pair of bumps will roughly lead to one particle production, and so this pair of bumps went here, this pair of bumps went here, you roughly got one pair of entangled particles, this one is particle which is outside the hole, this one is on the part of the slice which is inside the hole, and that's your particle pair. So this is the entire actual calculation of, uh, if you just do this mathematically, I'm just giving you the pictures. That's the essential uh, physics of particle production. Just take a Fourier mode on one slice. That's what you use to quantize particles. The slice stretches. You just move the Fourier mode. So its peak goes to where it was, and the peak goes to where it was just for null geodesics. Now you have a new shape of the slice. You analyze it now in terms of Fourier modes again. It's a new function. And it'll have some positive frequencies, some negative frequencies. And now you realize that if earlier all the the positive frequency modes were killing the vacuum. Now they, they are not because a mixture of positive and negative frequencies are killing the vacuum. So it's actually not the vacuum, and you see some particle pairs. So this is the calculation that Hawking basically did, and he found his particles. And so now, having seen where particle production comes from, we can go back to the, the schematic picture we had. So on this slice, the initial matter that made the hole is somewhere way down here, but we are interested in this part. Every time the slice stretches a bit, let's say we move it up from here to here by order 2m. Then each time you do that, one particle pair is produced in an entangled state. When I stretch it further, this guy moves over here, this guy moves here because I stretched out. And because of the stretching, a new particle pair is produced in here. So this is the entire process on which we are going to focus. So the picture is like this. I gave you a slice like this, and suppose it was the vacuum. Then leave the left side one third away, the right one third away, take the middle one third, let's say in this room, and stretch it to double its size. Then one particle pair will pop, pop in there. Fine, now we stretch this, again take the middle one third, stretch it out, the particle which was on the left moves away here, part of the right moves away there, in the middle a new particle pair pops up. Okay, so we keep creating new particle pairs in the middle and the other ones just go inside and outside. So the inside ones connect like this on this stretching slice, the outside ones connect here at infinity and new particle pairs get produced near the horizon. And so you can mathematically make all this proper in terms of what I was saying, but uh, for now we'll just work with this picture. Okay, so let's get all the scales for Hawking radiation. The short shell metric had only one length scale, the 2GM. Okay. And so the emitted quanta have what wavelength? There's only one scale, their wavelength is already R. What's the time between successive emissions? There's only one length scale, I put C to one. 
So that's R. And so how many quantities of the black hole emit before it disappears? The number of quantum is total mass of the black hole divided by the energy of each quantum. If the wavelength is R, energy of each quantum is 1 by R. And so you find it goes like m squared. And we can write that with the g is like 1 over m Planck squared. So mass of the black hole in Planck unit squared, that's the number of particles you emit. Okay, so it's all in here. If you want to ask for the evaporation time, these many particles are emitted. The interval between different emissions is again proportional to m. So emission time goes like m cube. Anything you want to know about the black hole scale wise, it's all here. Okay, so this is the scales of Hawking radiation. And the important thing was the emission cannot stop as long as there's a horizon because the slices cannot stabilize as long as there's a horizon. And that's because time and space interchange rails rolls on the inside r less than 2m, and that's why it can't stabilize. So it all has to do with the horizon. Otherwise, you can get particle production for just one or two particles, and nobody worries too much about that. Are there any questions on this so far? Because let me just correct two questions and move on to the uh, remaining part of this lecture. So again, if somebody gives you a model by which he's solving the puzzle, you have to ask him, do you have the vacuum state at the horizon? If not, why not? And if you have the vacuum state at the horizon, then do you get the creation of entangled pairs by the stretching? Because you've seen the slices, they just have to stretch. So how do you make a geometry where the slices don't stretch? If they stretch, how can your wave modes not mix positive and negative frequencies? So how can you not create particles? So it's really that basic. OK, so let me just pause a little uh, minute here to see if there are any questions so far, because then I'll go to the last part of the talk, where I'll actually try to give you a rigorous form of all the uh, rough things that we have said so far. Yes, question back there. OK, very good. So let's ask where general relativity is valid. So the general belief is that you keep using classical general relativity as long as the curvature length scale is longer than Planck length, because the natural length scale, which comes out of quantum gravity, involves Planck length. So if you look at where the curvature scales are, where they become Planck length, that happens in the vicinity of the singularity. So I think everybody would be happy to say that you, can, you definitely can't use classical gravity within a few Planck lengths of r equal to 0. But the fact that you should not use it anywhere else, well, that's the important question. It's a very crucial question. If you can give me some reason that you should not use quant uh, classical gravity in the, in the region around the horizon, let's say from r equals m to r equals 2m, then there is no puzzle, absolutely. And in fact, when we come to solve the puzzle using fuzzballs, I will actually give you a reason why you do not have to use class why classical gravity has to break down. In fact, semi-classical gravity has to break down in the region inside the horizon. So we will go into that as our solution. But right now, if I'm just using classical GR and starting from there without any string theory or anything, my only criteria for the breakdown is whether the curvature reaches Planck scale and the curvature is below Planck scale everywhere till I get close to a singularity. So exactly what we are going to look for is a second mode of breakdown for general relativity. The one mode of breakdown of classical GR is when the curvature reaches Planck scale. That's not happening here at the horizon. We are going to look for a second mode of breakdown where the gen classical general relativity breaks down, but not because the curvature is becoming large. And that's actually going to lead us to a solution of the puzzle. But let me continue, allow you to continue with your question. So, uh, I said that when you said the mass becomes negative, the test particle, yes. this makes me feel that then you have the tachyon, then everything becomes unstable. So this is the theory. Then I say the theory is dropped down. OK, you could say that. The, the problem is that locally, there is actually no tachyon. So if you take the entire slice like this, yeah. on the inside of the black hole, the slice was going like this, and time evolution was actually this way. And if you do all that, you measure the local stress tensor, it's all nice and positive. But because the slice goes like this and this, in terms of what we think of as what we want to call time on the outside, this looks negative. So if you use a time-like killing vector for the entire geometry, in terms of that killing vector, this object inside has negative energy. But locally, if you use the direction of time, which is locally on that slice, it actually has nice positive energy, which every particle must have. So in some sense, this is a reformulation of what the black hole is doing for you. It's bending the slice so much that the killing vector, which is valid outside, has given you opposite signs for the energy inside. So that's the problem, really. Yeah. Your Say again? Your laptop is charging. <laughs> My laptop is not charging. Thank you for letting me know. It should have charged because it was plugged in. Is it behaving any better now? Looks okay? 
Yeah, if it's about to die, just tell me. Okay, so given that we are stuck in so many different ways, uh, what would string theory people say? They can't have the remnants. The GR people were happy with the remnants, and so they were sleeping peacefully. But string theory should not have been sleeping peacefully because string theory is based on normal quantum mechanics. And so we should not violate quantum mechanics like Hawking was requesting us to do. And we can't have remnants. And so why were string theorists happily doing whatever they were doing? And part of the reason was that many string theorists actually thought that they could get away with the puzzle through something called small corrections. It's just a rough way of saying that nobody really took Hawking very seriously. They thought that his argument was like a rough argument. And if somebody really started to look at it, maybe there would be a hole in it somewhere. We were looking for holes and we haven't found one, and the GR people hadn't found one. But string theorists always have faith only in themselves, and so they thought maybe we'll find a hole somewhere. And so where was the hole they were looking for? Okay. And the hole they were looking for was here. As you see, they weren't quite right about this, but uh, at least this is what was making people not worry too much about the problem all these years. You know, people doing string theory happily for 40 years without focusing mainly on the information puzzle. So let's ask, what's the solution in string theory? So what is the issue of small corrections? So here we draw the same picture again. The Fourier modes are evolving. And if you just take these red lines, you have the information paradox. We did all that. But there can always be some small correction. I've drawn a small correction to this wave function in these little blue dotted lines. They are supposed to be slightly different, which can come from anywhere. There can be small quantum gravity effects, which should be very small for a big black hole. But of course, that can be there. Nobody can say that they can't be there. OK, but why should you worry if a correction is very small? If it's one part in 10 to the 100, how does it affect your puzzle? And the reason it might affect your puzzle is that you're going to emit a very large number of quanta, which is the number of quanta was m or m Planck whole square. That's much bigger than 1. So even if there was, let's say, a 1% correction to every quantum which was emitted, but you emitted, let's say, 100 quanta, maybe the 1% trades off against the 100, and in the end, there is really no problem. Okay, So certainly, that's something worth thinking about. It's a very uh, a logical thing to think about. And so let's just put that in concrete terms. Hawking only did a leading order computation. So in the leading order computation, what did he do? He got his entangled pairs. I'll now start putting some notation up here. So the outside members, I'll call them Bs. So in the first pair, I call the outside guy B1 and the inside guy C1. Then the B1 and C1 moved out. The B1 went out here, C1 went out here because of stretching. And then the B2 and C2 were created. And the B1 and C1 were entangled. So at this slice, I had no entanglement between the outside and the inside. Outside is outside the dotted line. Inside is inside. OK, so I think I lost my power in this again. OK, I got it back. That's OK. So uh, entanglement was 0 on this slice. Here, because I have one pair entangled, let's say, in my toy model as 0, 0, plus 1, 1. So 0 and 0, no particle modes here and no particle mode here plus the possibility of one particle here, one particle here, and so on. So this entanglement is log 2, because there are two entangled states. So this is log 2. And once you have two of these particles, uh, the full state will become the matter state, which I had in the beginning, tensored with this, and tensored with this. So every particle pair is independent, and independent of the initial matter to leading order. This was Hawking's assumption. And so after n steps, you just get n times log 2. And this was Hawking's leading order calculation. Now, of course, not every pair will be independent of the initial matter. And each pair can make a slight correction to the previous pair. So there will be small correlations. And we should worry about them. Because if there are so many pairs involved, it's possible that all those small corrections put together might get us out of the puzzle. So let's see what the puzzle, how it would get us out. So at leading order, we had this kind of pair. I'm just writing it down here again. But what do the small corrections do? Here they were only in pictures. But let's put that down in something concrete we can write something about. So suppose this was the leading order answer. We can add a little bit of the orthogonal state to this. There are many orthogonal states to this. I've just taken one for simplicity. This is the orthogonal state to this one. I can add this with a coefficient. The only important thing is the coefficient must be small. Because if it was big, then I don't have any, my horizon evolution is completely changed. And then I have to come back and tell you, well, how has it changed? I had no hair at the classical level. I had no hair at the quantum level. I can't change it by a big amount. But some subtle quantum gravity effect could make a small change. So if epsilon is much less than 1, you can't really complain about the fact that this evolution or leading order evolution taken by Hawking could perhaps be altered to this one. OK, so if I include this extra piece, what does it do? So you can now see what will happen at the next step. At the first step, we just had this. Suppose there was no effect. And let's start to make it concrete how we want to take those corrections into account. Suppose we say at the next step of emission, if at the first step I had 0, 0, no particle production. At the next step, suppose I enhance the 0, 0 compared to the 1, 1 
Right now they were 50-50. I took it equal amounts, 0, 0, plus 1, 1. But instead of taking it 0, 0, plus 1 with equal amounts, if the first pair was 0 and 0 in B1 and C1, then for the second pair, I make it a little bit more of 0, 0. See, for B2 and C2, I made a little bit more of 0, 0, and a little bit less of the 1, 1. So you can see here I have introduced correlation between the first pair and the second pair. And if the first pair is 1, 1 for B1 and C1, I put a different amount of shifts for the 0, 0 and 1, 1 for the B2. So if I choose different numbers, epsilon 1 and epsilon 1 prime, then I can you know, use the first, what happened in the first uh, evolution, whether I got 0, 0 or 1, 1 for B1 and C1, I can use it to change the relative weights of the two parts for the pair B2 and C2 and in different ways for the two occurrences. And so I get these correction terms. If you keep all the terms which don't have any epsilon in them, you just get the leading order state which we had on the previous slide. But now you can start seeing the terms which are proportional to epsilon, those are the corrections. And you can start seeing the number of corrections increasing very rapidly. And uh, what do you mean by increase rapidly? After n steps of emission, there are two to the n correction terms. So you can see that the, uh, the argument actually on the face of it is very reasonable. If each correction term is very small, but the number of correction terms grows exponentially, uh, then after you emit a lot of particles, the correction terms can be so significant that they can overwhelm the leading order answer. So in pictures, this is the hope that at leading order, you just get this entanglement between a particle and its own emitted pair and doesn't care about the other particles. But there are these small corrections to the other ones which are drawn by dotted lines. If this guy is a little bit entangled with its other partners also. And then because the number of emitted quanta is very large, it's like this. If we, at some point we draw a dividing line between the outside and the inside, we can call this some radius like 10m or something, and this is outside, far outside. Then the entanglement, after in the leading order, if I keep that, entanglement is growing and growing like Hopkins showed us. But if at sub leading orders I include all of these, maybe the entanglement actually starts going down. Because there are so many of these terms, we got to check if that can actually make the entanglement start going down. And if you can actually solve the puzzle problem this way, then there's no information paradox in the first place. Then you just say that Hawking to leading order calculation, and then if you take into account all the subleading problems, uh, correction terms, uh, they remove that problem. So the reason this possibly looks plausible is that normal bodies also have a behavior where in the beginning, the entanglement of the outside, the radiation, with what is left behind goes up. This is the emission steps I'm plotting here, and here's the entanglement. In the beginning, it goes up, but by the time the body evaporates away, in the end, it comes down. So you can see how it works. Here's a piece of coal. So that's a normal body which is evaporating. And here's an atom in the piece of coal, and it emits a photon. That's the photon going out. Okay. So normally, the atom and the photon will be entangled. So if the atom, if the photon emitted is spin up, the atom can be left spin down. If the photon emitted is spin down, the atom will be left in spin up. So you can see, as it starts, each atom starts emitting a photon, uh, the entanglement between the outside and what is left behind can go up. But after some time, this atom here will also float out like a piece of ash. And now at infinity, or far away, you have these two guys, and they are entangled with each other. So after some time, the coal is gone, and you have a lot of guys there, but each is entangled with its own partner. And so the entanglement is all just OK between here. So entanglement of what is at infinity and what's left behind, well, that is 0. And so at this point, when the thing evaporates, there's no entanglement. And now this guy can disappear into the vacuum, and there is no puzzle. So normal bodies behave this way, and so there is no puzzle. And so what are we really hoping for by looking at small corrections? What we're hoping for is that when we take all these small dashed lines into account, the epsilon order corrections, then in fact the entanglement goes to zero. So what Hawking found, the leading order answer kept going up and up all the way till the end of evaporation. But suppose the small correction turned back towards this, then this guy can completely evaporate and there is no puzzle. So at first this looks a little difficult to prove or disprove because on the other hand, you don't know where the corrections are coming from. So you don't know what the values of the epsilons are. There could be anything because they're coming from, from some unknown quantum gravity source, so we don't actually know what they're doing. And it's true, the number of particles is very large, and in fact, exponentially large, due to the n is exponentially large. So how do we ever argue that these corrections will not change the answer like this, so maybe there is no puzzle? But in fact, we'll see that you can argue that there is no puzzle. So there's this, just to uh, remove this possibility, I have this theorem from 2009, which shows that even though it looks like a very plausible and at first very reasonable thing to argue, it's actually, in fact, not true. So to, to actually prove that, I just pick up some notation. You won't need to know too much about entanglement entropy. And given the lectures you've already had, you probably already know this. But just to put some notation up here, suppose you have two systems A and B. The states of this are called psi m for system A, 
chi n for system B, a typical entangled state which can be expanded in a general form, some C m n, psi a of m, chi b of n. This is an orthonormal basis for this. This is an orthonormal basis for this. So you can by definition write any state for the combined system in this form. Is that okay? And that's generally entangled. You can make a unitary transformation of system A and a unit transformation system B to just write in a simpler form. It doesn't much matter, but you can write it like this so that it look like some simple state of some state of system A, some state of system B, and now it just looks like a sum over one guy index. Okay, you don't have to do that, but it just looks nicer if you write it like that. And you can always trace out the degrees of freedom in one system, let's say system B, to leave you a density matrix for the other system, uh, uh, system A, and then the density matrix for this state, which only keeps A and traces out B, well, that looks like this. We won't actually have reason to use this. I just wrote it down just to connect to what uh, the other speakers were doing when they needed this. Okay, so the entanglement entropy of A with the rest of the system is then defined as, if you take the density matrix, you can take trace of rho log rho minus, and that's called the entanglement system A with system B. So in terms of those Cs, this is what amount. There should be a minus sign here. This is what amounts to in terms of those Cs. So if you take this and go back to the previous slide and you see that if you had a system which just had two pieces entangled, just two of them entangled, this would be one by root two, one by root two for each of them. In that case, each of the CIs are one by root two and you have an entangled state. And then if you put it in here, you will find this entanglement entropy comes out to be log two. Okay, so that's how it just, it's just a rough measure of entanglement. But we don't need this. All we need from this is that entanglement entropy, it has some properties and we just want those properties. Okay. So, uh, Firstly, if A is entangled with B, then B is entangled with A. If I trace out B, it's the same as tracing out A, because if the whole system is pure, SA is equal to SB. It can behave very differently from classical entropy, because if, only, if the total system was pure, but A was entangled with B, then A plus B, total thing is not entangled with anybody. So it's entangled, its total entropy is zero. So the entanglement entropy of the system A plus B is actually zero, but S of A is not zero, because A is entangled with B, and S of B is not zero, because it's entangled with A, so SA is equal to SB. So that's why it's very different from classical entropy, because classically if A and B uh, had equal entropies, the entropy of A plus B would be twice of S of A. But here the total has no entanglement entropy. But these are obvious facts about entanglement. Let's just keep them in mind. The property we actually need, however, is this one. Uh, if you have, uh, okay, this was just definition from the previous slide. Suppose you have more systems, A, B, C, and then also a, a, a background bath of a fourth system, which I call D. But well, now you can start playing very funny games with this and make interesting inequalities. And the inequality which I'm interested in is called strong subjectivity of quantum entanglement entropy. And that goes like the following. So because I have these four guys here, and I assume the overall state is pure, then uh, entanglement entropy of A plus B will say with the entanglement entropy of C plus D. Right? Because there's nothing else I assume outside these. But then D was just like a heat bath. I don't really care about D. I'm going to focus on A, B, and C. And the entropy of A plus B with the remainder, remainder being C plus D, and then if you add to that the entanglement of B plus C with the remainder, which is now A and D, is bigger than S of A, which means keep A and trace out B, C, and D, and S of C, which means you just keep C and trace out the other three. Okay, this is not easy to prove. So the, this was proved by Lieb and Ruskaya in the 70s. There's a rough physicist understanding of how this goes, which is not a proof by Kalyan Rama from 2014. If you want, I can give you that reference. But it's a rather difficult thing to prove. But anyway, this is the... Uh, theorem which we are actually going to use, and this has the power to help us actually prove that the small corrections cannot help us. If they did, there was no puzzle, and if they don't, then the Hawking puzzle has really become uh, a headache because now there's no other way to get around it, and then we have to do something about it. Okay, so let me just quickly go through the proof. To do that, all we have to do is to understand the model, and then the, we just apply the inequality and we'll get our answer, and then I'll stop for the day. So here's our model, you've seen this picture already. And step A, Outside the black hole, I just take some point which is far outside. So let's say at r greater than 10m, we just assume there is normal physics. So everything you expect in this room happens for, let's say, r greater than 10m. Any interesting black hole effects, let's say, have died out by then. Okay. So you can change any of these things. Okay. You can make a different models, and people have. And okay. so, But right now, I'm just going to assume that. And in the region inside that, you can use some kind of you know, field theory, if you like, and so on. But you, can, you must have the semi-classical black hole physics to a good approximation in the region at least, let's say, from r equals m to r equals 10m. Because if you don't have good, a good approximation to semi-classical physics there, 
then your hair is completely, they have no, you have broken the no hair theorem, and then you go to come and tell me why. But we assume that no hair theorem is basically okay. They just have small quantum gravity effects coming from some small leakage somewhere. Those are the ones we are after. So up to small corrections, we have normal physics all the way here. And even though this is an R equals M, and you might have thought there would have to be normal physics here, I'll actually assume nothing about this. And the reason is that these slices become very long. Right? As we keep waiting, the slices become very long. And so you might start wondering, if the slice is so long, then maybe the stretching of slice that long is not good for some reason. So we won't actually use that. We just need to know that in the region where the pairs are being produced, uh, we just have normal physics. So it's close to normal physics here because there can be small corrections. We assume normal physics out here. Nothing changes once they are beyond 10m. And we make no claim about the physics here. This is the input. And let's see where we go with this. So again, the near evolution near the horizon of Fourier modes, the stretching, that will create the pairs. And we can all say space time is an approximation. There can be a small correction to the Hawking process. But anyway, this is the Hawking process. And here we don't really care. There may not be any space time or anything. We just care about the behavior near the horizon. We try to use as little as we can. Well, here's the notation now. So the particles which are outside this region, 10m, b1, b2, up to bn, they are particles that have already been emitted. I just denoted them collectively by b. All the particles which are the pair which are now being created at the next step from n to n plus 1, those are bn plus 1 and cn plus 1. Okay? And the other particles are in here. This is all I need. So this is the notation. Okay. Then we use the symbol s of a for the entanglement of a with the whole of everything else. Okay? So this notation is already standard. And now the question is we want the entanglement of the outside, r greater than 10m, with everything that is inside. We want to know if it can keep growing, if it has to keep growing, or if it can grow and maybe turn down because of small corrections. OK, so let's start with what we know. Entanglement step n is the entanglement of the step set b with everything else. OK, that's just definition. If the, at, at step n, these are the particles outside. If s of n is the entanglement of the outside with the inside at step n, is the entanglement of the set b with everything else. So it is s of b. Is that good with everybody? If some notation is not clear, please, please ask. Most of this is notation, and then we'll just jump and get the answer. At the next step, now from step n, at the next step, the physics inside this region, r equals 10m, the slice stretches, and a new pair is produced. Here's a new pair. But this is all some operation which we assume is a unitary operation inside the full quantum gravity theory of the black hole. But if there's a unitary operation inside some system, it doesn't change the entanglement of the outside with that system. It's just a property of entanglement entropy. If this system is entangled with you people, whatever you do there, you may, your state may change, but the entanglement of this system with all of you, that cannot change. OK, so at this point, the entanglement at step n, uh, which had is still s of b, and so at this point, the entanglement of b uh, is still remains the same. The creation of the pair doesn't change the entanglement of set b with everything inside. But now let's focus on entanglement of the new pair. The new pair were b n plus 1 and c n plus 1, and they were in this state, we assume to leading order. At leading order, if they were like this, then uh, the set B was entangled with set with C maximally. And in fact, they were entangled with uh, an entangled entropy of log 2 with each other. But because they were entangled with each other maximally, the pair was not entangled with anything else. At leading order, it was just entangled with the B and C entangled with itself maximally. And so they actually can't entangle with anybody else as so an entanglement of this set, B n plus 1, C n plus 1, S of A means the entanglement of this set with everybody else. The pair are with each other, but the whole pair are not entangled with anybody else, again in the leading order. And the, the element B n plus 1, if you ask for its entanglement, because it's entangled with C maximally, well, its entanglement was log 2. Okay, I'm just picking up for the leading order answer. Now, since you actually want to make some small corrections, now the numbers don't have to be what they are, but because you make small corrections, this entanglement can become something non-zero, but still small. Let me say this entanglement changes because small corrections to something which is less than a parameter epsilon 1, where epsilon 1 is much less than 1. And for cn plus 1, uh, I think I should have written maybe cn plus 1 here, not b. For cn plus 1, that was also log 2. It was log 2, and it cannot change. It can become a little less than log 2. It can never become more than log 2 because c has only two states. But it can change. But because the corrections are small, I assume it does not change much. So it only changes, let's say, from log 2 to log 2 minus epsilon 2. And the epsilon 2, again, has to be much less than 1. So my small corrections have now gone in in this assumption. If you actually want the full derivation of these, then they are actually uh, in the paper I referred to. So I think this one has died out. But I don't think you actually need the pointer if you can still see what I'm doing there. 
So now let's see, we're coming to the crucial step now. At the next step, the Bn plus 1 floats out. So the Bn plus 1 has now gone out and joined the step of guys which were outside. Is there another pointer here, by the way? I actually just need one more minute if that's okay, and then I'll stop. So which button do you press for the pointer? Top one? Okay, good. I got that. So at the next step, the Bn plus 1 moves out. The Cn plus 1 just keeps going in. And now all this is outside. So entangled entropy at step n plus 1, again, this is just a definition, is entangled entropy of the set B and Bn plus 1, this set with everything else. Still just a definition, so nothing has been done. Okay. I'll just advance the slide here. Okay, now actually we can put it all together and we are done. This is really the last thing I need here. So now we're going to use a strong solidarity inequality with the set A as being the set B, the set B being just this one quanta B n plus one, the set C being just the one quanta C n plus one. And now we recall all the things we had on the previous slides. We said entanglement entropy at step n was entanglement of set B with everything. Entanglement entropy at step n plus one was entanglement of B and B n plus one with everything. Entanglement of this pair with everything else was small because leading order it was zero. Entanglement of C n plus one was locked to at leading order, so now it can't be too small, so it has to be greater than this minus some small epsilon. Okay, you plug these four facts into this inequality and you find that this plus this is bigger than this. I'll leave you to check it out at leisure after I just finish the discussion. And if you just put in there, you see this is S n plus one, this is S at step n, and if you just move things around, you'll find the entanglement entropy at step n plus one is bigger than entanglement entropy at step n plus log two. This was the leading order answer of this calculation. You can have a reduction because of small corrections. Reduction is bounded by this much. So if epsilon is small, the entanglement entropy has to keep going up because it can't ever turn down. It has to keep going up if the epsilon is less than one. And the fact you have lots of particles being emitted, you can't trade that large number of emitted particles against the smallness of the correction at each step. So if this was the Hawking process, you can't actually use small corrections to turn it over to this. Okay. So now you have a serious problem because now you have shown that the Hawking argument of 1975 is stable against all small corrections. So now you have a, a, a real puzzle because now if you don't have small corrections, can't fix it. Now you have to use large corrections somehow. You have to change the horizon completely in some way. And from all the efforts of the no-head theorems and so on, we don't know how to change the horizon. So either we change the horizon or we do some of the more uh, you know, unconventional things that many people have talked about. People have very interesting ideas about you know, non-local effects, non-local effects for high-energy particles, and uh, you know, bits at infinity not being uh, independent of bits inside. So many ideas can be tried, but something really needs to be done because the puzzle is now real. There was a question at the back there. Yes, that's a good question. The place it is violated is that the assumptions are not the same. So here we said that the particle pair B and C is coming out when it comes out because it comes out of the vacuum. It's in a maximally entangled state with each other and the pair not entangled with anybody else. So each pair comes out in the same state at leading order, 0, 0, plus 1, 1. In the sun, something very different is true. When the next emission is happening, if the atom on the surface was spin up, then the photon emits may be spin up. If the atom on the surface was spin down, the next emission from there might be spin down. So the emission which happens for the next step of emission depends on what was actually on the surface at that time. It's not the same state at each step, and it's not a state which is then uh, that emitted pair is not independent of all the other particles in the theory. So what we are really showing is the sun, of course, keeps behaving like a normal body, and diamond goes up and comes down. But if you have any Hawking-like process where the pairs are created to leading order just entangled with each other and not entangled with anything, which is natural something coming out of the vacuum, then that is a stable situation. Stable in the sense any small change to that, including small correction or small entanglement other things, are not going to help you. That's what has been proved. It just made the, if you're coming out in the entangled form in the Hawking way, then the Hawking argument is stable against any source of small corrections, as long as these assumptions are okay, that you know, infinity once something leaves, you don't affect it and so on. And there are models, as you have seen, where once something leaves, you can still go and change it because of people have argued for wormholes going out there and so on. So those can invalidate the theorem. But if you assume it's like burning like a piece of paper, where once a photon leaves, you can assume it leaves. We don't, have, we don't assume it changes after that. If you assume that, then you're stuck here. OK, more questions?